Hello everyone who is following us online. A very warm welcome to our side event on climate resilience principles for inclusive and sustainable infrastructure. This side event is hosted by Jam and Watch, the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, LIA, and the Indian Network on Ethics and Climate. My name is Alexandra Goris and I'm a policy advisor at German Wood and I will be moderating this event for you. I'm very pleased to share this panel uh, with a group of distinguished experts who I will very briefly introduce before giving you an overview of this event. So we have Thomas Hirsch of Climate Development and Ad Climate and Development Advice. We have Abhinash Mohanty from the Council on Environment, Electricity and Water in India. And we have Fuzula Talkude of the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh. A very warm welcome to all of you. So now let me give you a brief overview of what we will be discussing today. Infrastructure plays a decisive role in the implementation of the Paris Agreements. Uh, a resilience goal, but also in the implementation of the SDGs. So investing in sustainable infrastructure projects is a prerequisite to help lift hundreds of millions out of poverty, fulfill their basic rights, and to adequate food, access to water, health, education, and housing. By 2030, it is estimated that six trillion US dollars will be invested in urban energy, water, information technology, and transport infrastructure every year and most of it will be invested in developing countries. Ensuring that these investments are climate resilient, inclusive and sustainable requires a new set of standards and principles that provide guidance to infrastructure stakeholders such as multilateral development banks or MDBs. Um, with that, I will hand over to our panelists um, on how these principles could look like. And our first panelist is Thomas Hirsch. He's the founding director of the Global Consultancy Network Climate and Development Advice. Thomas provides trainings, project consultancy, and policy advice. He has previously worked at organizations such as Greenpeace and Bread for the World, and as a lecturer of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alex. Warm welcome from my side as well. I'm going to present on climate resilience principles for inclusive and sustainable infrastructure investments. Um, my presentation is being based on a study that was conducted by an international consortium of NGOs from Bangladesh, China, India and Germany. And I'm going to present very briefly the results of that study. So about us, as I said, multiple countries, Global North and Global South. We are united in our cooperation to enhance climate action through infrastructure investment. And we pursue our goal through policy research, multi-stakeholder dialogues, and with a particular focus in this study on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, short AIIB, and its alignment with the goals of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. So we have analyzed so far three dimensions of alignment. We started to look at the alignment of AIIB with the 1.5 or 2 degrees temperature goal of the Paris Agreement in 2019 that was followed by a study which I'm going to present today on the alignment with, climate, with the climate resilience goal and with, it will be followed shortly by another study looking into urban infrastructure investments. As we have heard from Alex, infrastructure investments matter very much for climate resilience building and development banks can drive change. We have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis that the form and function of infrastructure is a key factor to make societies and economies more resilient in case of external shocks. And we also saw very clearly that poor and vulnerable population groups need special attention because they have significantly less access to infrastructure um, if no additional efforts are being met. As we have heard, the world is investing heavily in infrastructure, six trillion US dollar per year. And um, the way how these investments are being met will decide whether the future infrastructure of the world um, hosting shortly 10 billion people will be climate resilient and carbon neutral or not. 
as I said, development banks are the most important investors, at least in developing countries, when it comes to infrastructure, such like energy, water, transport, communication, urban, and also the agricultural sector. We have tackled a number of guiding questions in our study. What are important reference frameworks for climate resilient infrastructure investments? What role does climate resilience already play in the policies, strategies and guidelines of AIIB? How climate resilient is the portfolio of, the, of that bank and what would be adequate investment principles for climate resilience building and poverty orientation? And we also looked at possible first implementation steps to apply these principles in practice. The key outcomes or takeaways of our study very shortly. Climate related damage to infrastructure will rise to about 4 to 13 trillion US dollar by the end of the century if no investments are being met in resilience. And coastal cities and particularly coastal cities in Asia will suffer, suffer the greatest damage. So far, the requirements to enhance climate resilience are implemented by MDBs at best in a fragmented manner. And especially we found that the focus on vulnerable groups, sectors and countries lacks adequate attention. If we look at MDBs, then we would conclude that EBRD is currently best in class. The AIIB's water and urban sector strategies have a focus on resilience, while the other strategies of AIIB lack that focus. And AIIB altogether lacks implementation tools. In particular, AIIB's risk management framework does not address climate risks properly. That means that the key risk indicators do not reflect project susceptibility to climate risks based on climate risk data. AIIB so far seems not to follow the approach of credit rating agencies like Moody's that already use indicator-based tools to assess climate risks to credits. Those could be used as a baseline for impact monitoring throughout the entire project investment cycle. Now looking very briefly at AIIB's project portfolio and its contribution to climate resilience building. Uh, we did the stock take um, in the end of 2020. By that date, AIIB counted 70 approved projects worth um, 13.74 billion US dollar and another 36 projects in their project pipeline worth another 10.4 billion in altogether 21 countries. Of the approved projects, only 30% were in the energy sector and 20% in the water and urban sector. The largest share at that date um, was on the transport sector and that is also reflected in the project pipeline uh, with the transport sector as the most important investment sector followed by COVID-19 response projects. Comparing the project portfolio with the project pipeline shows us that the climate focus has decreased instead of increased. Um, and if we look at the projects, we would say that nine projects altogether um, have a relevant adaptation component. Twelve projects are at least climate proofed. I will come back to that in a second and 16 projects altogether have a certain poverty orientation. Now, then we looked at AIIB's current toolbox to ensure climate resilience. We found that climate resilience is a priority indeed in the water and the urban sector strategies, and that in these two strategies, poverty orientation plays a certain role too. While in other strategies, which account for most of the project, climate resilience building and poverty orientation are no priorities. And the business plan and the strategic programming of AIIB do not explicitly reflect climate risks and poverty orientation. 
Also, we found that at the level of um, the risk management framework, climate risks are not covered, at least not at the level of risk indicators. And these deficits are also reflected in the project portfolio, except, again, in the water strategy. So far, we conclude AIB has no systemic approach to dealing with climate risks and no vision of how the Paris Climate Resilience Goal could be implemented. We suggest to adopt three climate resilience principles to align the portfolio and the investment policy with the Paris Agreement. First of all, projects shall not harm and that means that AIIB infrastructure investments should not undermine the climate resilience of people and ecosystems, especially not of the poor and climate vulnerable ones. Secondly, as a second principle, we ask for climate proving, and that means that all AIIB infrastructure investments should be protected themselves effectively during their entire lifespan against value loss caused by adverse climate impacts. Finally, through its investments, AIIB should enhance what we call systemic resilience, and that means that AIIB infrastructure investments should be optimized in a way that they contribute to adaptation, that they contribute to protect human systems and ecosystems against climate impacts. We further suggest seven pro-poor principles. First of all, projects should have measurable value for the poor. Secondly, they should enhance structural transformation to climate resilient, sustainable development through their investments. Thirdly, AIIB should support enabling policy frameworks, as for example, NDCs. Fourth, projects should ensure accessibility to infrastructure for poor and vulnerable groups and also, the next principle, they should um, provide affordable infrastructure. Sixth point, participation of poor and vulnerable population groups in all phases of the climate project cycle have to be ensured and finally transparency in all the project cycle faces is very much important. How to implement these, policy, or these principles? We conclude with 25 um, recommendations for implementation and I will shortly mention 10. First, taking up the pro-poor principles we propose in the joint MDB Paris alignment framework. Secondly, ensure that the alignment commitment with the Paris Agreement's resilience goal is mainstreamed, mainstreamed and operationalized throughout all AIIB policies, strategies and projects. Third, to assess the effectiveness of already existing resilience approaches of the bank and present the findings to the board of directors. Fourth, ensure that the alignment is measurable, reportable and verifiable, including for strategic programming, sector strategies and the risk management frameworks. Fifth, for measuring impact in terms of resilience building, we suggest to introduce metric result indicators at the uh, project portfolio level which already exists in the water strategy and which should be extended to the other sector strategies. Climate risk assessments should be conducted for all projects and they, that is very much important, should incorporate risk projections that cover all climate hazards for the entire infrastructure lifespan. All necessary risk reduction measures resulting from the results of the risk assessments should be taken to climate proof the investment. And if there remains a residual risk, that should be quantified and covered by appropriate risk finance, financing measures. If there is a risk 
that the investment undermines climate resilience of vulnerable people or ecosystems, risk mitigation measures should be taken to ensure that the do-no-harm principle is being fulfilled. The key risk indicators in the risk management framework of the bank should be amended to assess and quantify possible financial risks caused by sudden but also slow onset events. And finally, we suggest to open a financing channel for small and medium-sized climate resilience building infrastructure projects to the benefit of poor and vulnerable people. I would like to end my presentation with a short outlook. We are now about to publish guidance notes for sustainable urban infrastructure investments. And here we discuss how AIIB can advance the urban transformation. That study discusses climate resilience building, but it also looks at climate neutrality and, again, a pro-poor focus and how this can be operationalized. We suggest seven urban infrastructure principles for operationalization, the urban net zero principle, the urban efficient land use and spatial planning principle, the nature positive city principle, which means that infrastructure should be positive in its effects on nature, the urban circular economy and zero waste principle, the socially inclusive and resilient city principle, the urban pro-poor principle, and last but not least, the urban climate resilience principles. And that climate resilience principle would require for the urban sector three implementation pathways, as we will then discuss in the study. The first one is a pathway of technical adaptation through infrastructure. The second one of behavioral ad adaptation starting at the planning level. And the third one, nature-based solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I hand over or back to our moderator. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your very comprehensive uh, presentation. That was very impressive. And I'll hand over to our second speaker. And this is Ivanash Mohanty. He is a program lead in the risks and adaptation team at the Council on Environment, Energy and Water in India. And he's involved in designing decision-making toolkits for effective policymaking on climate change risks, sustainability and environment and resource management. He has more than 10 years of experience in evidence-based policy research on climate change impacts and risks, water management, climate change financing, and managing projects. He's also a reviewer of the IPCC's sixth assessment report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. Avinash, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you, Thomas, for setting the context. Well, uh, you touched upon the toad's eye view that I would say, and the toad's eye view of why infrastructures are important. What I'm going to talk about is primarily the, uh, the context of a developing nation who is, who is yet to build more than 50% of its infrastructure. But while we talk about infrastructures, while we talk about uh, climate proofing, uh, investments in infrastructures, what is more important is understanding that granular risk. And that granular risk provides us the context why infrastructures are no more just a topic of investment for multilateral banks or for negotiations. While at a negotiation level, it needs enhanced finance. Uh, throughout my presentation, I'm also going to uh, touch upon the larger point that infrastructure means people at its core. Until unless, and Thomas, you touched upon the fact that vulnerable communities are uh, part of uh, some of, uh, they should be part of the climate risk assessments. And this is where I would say that uh, the state of vulnerability of India is quite high. But the state of vulnerability when, uh, of India is quite high with five out of 20 Indians are vulnerable to extreme events. More than 80% of its population is uh, vulnerable to extreme events. What is more important is that the, the climate context of having the infrastructures climate proof because they are, are the trinity of job growth and sustainability so infrastructure development is not just about providing that adaptation means rather 
it would provide us in terms of helping how we can generate our life and livelihoods. So basically, why infrastructure climate proofing is important, this is what it is. Uh, India has already incurred more than 79.5 billion of infrastructure loss, whereas if we invest in climate proofing infrastructure, then we are going to generate 650 plus jobs and uh, there's this jobs per year uh, in terms of millions and, and every $1 spent can feature us $4 in terms of preparing us and saving that loss amount. But at the same time, why India needs to climate proof its infrastructure? It is primarily because uh, it's going to invest 1.5 trillion. And uh, with this, what is more important is uh, India India's 80% of the population is vulnerable. And since they are vulnerable, people should be at the core. And that is why what I'm going to present next is a short video of why, the, uh, why people should be at the core. Let's watch this video. पिला दिन जो वर्षा होतला से ठीक टाइम रे ऋतु भी थला बहुत बढ़िया रे वर्षा होतला ये पे जो 1969 मसिया ठु जो वर्षा हाउ जी से टाइम रे वर्षा हो से जो लघु सब हाउ जी कि बातिया दि चार दिन पोरे आछि से एका थरे के समस्त की खेती गस्त कर हमरो वर्षा दिने यदि लुणु पानी उठु छि पूरा धान पुछी नहीं जाए आम मोर जतले विवाह रहला मु ए जगह को आसिली समुद्र बहुत दूर रे थिला एबे त हम घर दाढे रे हेल समुद्र ई जो वातावरण चेंज हो गया बारिश का टाइम बारिश नहीं होता को लेट में होता है वो जो किया था अभी 15 दिन पहले जो बारिश हुआ बारिश ज्यादा हो गया वो पानी आ गया वो सब नष्ट हो गया अभी जो जलवायु परिवर्तन का वजह से यहाँ का लोगों में बहुत तकलीफ झेलने का जैसा मुद्दा उठ रहा है तो 12 साल से यहाँ पर यही है कि बारिश होता है तो पानी भर जाता है और सब पब्लिक लोग जिसका घर नीचे है वो लोग खाली करके चले जाते हैं फिर बारिश के बाद फिर रिटर्न आते हैं I think it's very important that when we say India is a highly climate vulnerable country, what does it mean? It's one thing to look at the country as a whole. It's a completely different thing to look at what it means for a particular district or a village, a small town, because that is where the people get exposed. That is where they are vulnerable. Localization obviously is the key, but one of the first thing is that we have to have granular information on hazard, risk, and vulnerability. And in that context, the work that CEW is doing for India to look at how uh, the climate risk is evolving at the district level is absolutely critical. <laughs> यहाँ पे कम्युनिटी के जो लोग हैं, उसने युवा के माध्यम से हमने उनका जल संगठन तैयार किया है, हमने एक टीम तैयार की, जिसमें मैपिंग, जो घर का मैप, अपने रोड का मैप, हमारे घर का मैप, समुद्र हमसे कितना दूरी पे है, या जब बाढ़ आती है, तो पानी कितने ऊपर नहीं तौर पर हमारे पास आता है, क्लाइमेट हमारा जो यहाँ पर युद्ध ग्रुप है, ये लोग अलग-अलग तरीके से इसका लिए स्ट्रीट प्ले करके लोगों को अवेयर करने का भी कोशिश करते हैं। जो मैंग्रोस हैं, उनमें कश्चर ले जाके डाल देते हैं और उनको मैंग्रोस को काटके वहाँ पर घर बनाते हैं। इससे ये सब हमें नहीं करना है और मैंग्रोस को काटने से रोकना है। ये जो है ये पोटिया है 
वो ज़्यादा बारिश होने पर पानी आ गया तो वो रहता है और दूसरा जो धान है वो ये पास में धान है वो हाईब्रिड जो है वो चला गया है सब नष्ट हो गया ये पोटिया है वो रहेगा एक महीना पानी रहेगा तो वो भी रह सकता है उसका कुछ नहीं होगा शायद अब पोटिया ज़्यादा डालेंगे महाबात्यार जंगल सब नष्ट आम घर तो केड़ा कुड़िया भाया मुंडी मुंडी सब दूसला आम हाँ पशिगला जंगल जी भागि तुटीगला समुद्र ढे तो आम आखि आगे नाचुच सदा बड़े भय भितर रुच नष्ट भितर तापर आम स्वयं सहायक गोष्ठी मिसिक दस ग्रुप आम से जंगल टाक या आम सका आम कोड़े जन लेखा पाड़ी कर दे गुटा बड़ हवा पर्यंत आम दस ग्रुप लगे बचे पर्यटन बात्या जेब आस जंगल आम उपकार कर दरिया पा रोक दूसरी When we look across India, we see that communities are coming together to build up that local capacity to handle big climate risks. The success factor behind that is prepared communities. We have been very successful in saving lives, but we still have huge economic losses. We really need to go beyond saving lives to also saving livelihoods. presented was exactly people at its core and people climate proofing our investments directly leads to climate proofing our infrastructures and climate proofing our populations that is where the core of infrastructure climate proofing actually happens and while uh, what thomas presented was uh, getting into the nuts and bolts of climate uh, i mean in terms of mainstreaming climate risk assessments but what is more important is we need to understand that infrastructure development the core of it lies in affordability accessibility and availability if you don't make investments for infrastructure available they can't be accessible and they can't be and and on top of it they should be affordable enough to build it because when we talk of infrastructure it is not the roads it's not the bridges or the airports that we build in of course they are hard infrastructures and we need them what do we do about the critical infrastructures what do we do about the nature based infrastructures a mangrove a forest every one of them are actually our infrastructures because they provide you that natural shock absorber in terms of uh, mitigating climate risk but where does the money come in and this is where i'm going to in a way uh put this uh what we call it as what an earth a cartoon series that our uh, team puts off every week and this is where we need the money adaptation financing the scope is under delivering with adaptation financing and developing countries like india bangladesh needs uh, that adaptation finance not in terms of charity or obligation they need that investment flow to come in so that vulnerable countries can actually step up their climate actions and at the same time can climate proof their lives livelihood and infrastructures to be large looking forward to the moderated discussion thank you so much abhinash for your presentation and the center on on people centered infrastructure investment so our last panelist is Fuzuela Talukta and he has been working as head of the climate change program at the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh since 2012 and he has previously been with several NGOs in the development sector focusing on topics such as food security climate change and community resilience building so we're very looking much forward to your presentation thank you Alex mm, and thank you Thomas and Avinash uh, for your don't set up and description of the 
climate um, change and the uh, impact of uh, climate change on the infrastructure and what we need to do and the principles um, set by Thomas also. Uh, we are, we, CCDB is going to present uh, the state of the climate change in Bangladesh and the impact of uh, the climate change on infrastructure and how CCDB is contributing uh, to the resilience infrastructure uh, into the um, infrastructure development in Bangladesh through uh, developing a climate center. The, you know, the Bangladesh is uh, densely populated, almost 170 million people. And this is uh, located in South Asia and bordered by India and uh, surrounded by the ocean, Bay of Bengal. This is low lying, almost five um, uh, meter high from the sea level. And per capita GDP is uh, per capita uh, income in 2,500 almost. And this uh, is the country who is exposed to disaster. Uh, dependency is very much on nature, people dependent on. And this is a labor intensive livelihood over there, inadequate infrastructure, and lower response capacity to disaster. This is the country situation of Bangladesh. And you can uh, see the um, impact of uh, disaster on infrastructure from 2014 to 2020. Um, a lot of disaster happened and almost 1,050 people died. 4.6 million houses damaged due to disaster and 4.1 billion um, economic losses happened. Economic losses in past 40 years were almost 12 billion, and uh, GDP is annually decreasing 0.05 to 1% due to disaster, basically. More than 80% of the population is exposed uh, to floods and droughts, more than 70% to cyclones who are living in the coastal areas, and 25% land goes under water each and every year due to flood. These are the scenario, and you can see the pictures how different infrastructures are um, um, uh, going um, under water uh, due to climate change. And Bangladesh is doing a lot um, to uh, fight with the climate change and how to protect the infrastructure, strengthening, uh, strengthening river embankment, coastal polders, roads and bridges, building emergency cyclone shelters, and homes, adapting rural households, farming system, reducing saline water intrusion, and implementing early warning system in the country. However, the future climate change induced highly intensively even poses huge threats. Uh, some researches show that uh, the corresponding damage to embankments is estimated to be about 4,271 and 13,996 kilometer by the year of 2030 and 2050s, respectively. The, and damage to highways due to floods alone is estimated to be around 1,000 and 3,000 kilometer by the year of 2030 and 2050. This is the future scenario, how infrastructure will be affected through disaster due to climate change. And CCDB is a very old NGO in Bangladesh and working to combat with the disaster from its very beginning. And it started its climate change program since 2009. And finally, um, uh, it, uh, in 2008, uh, it has started development of the climate center. Now I am going to um, uh, show you how this climate change program um, is contributing the climate change. This climate change program is consisting of four segments, basically. This is community resilience building and greenhouse gas emission reduction, research advocacy capacity building, and the, finally the climate center. The climate center we are going to develop in Bangladesh uh, to strengthen climate resilient, low carbon sustainable development as a regional hub, mainstreaming, transformative community-based adaptation, and climate risk reduction through accelerate innovation, capacity development, and knowledge dissemination. 
Now I am going to show the small video of Climate Center. In recent times, climate change is one of the frightening threats for human civilization. Bangladesh is one of the worst victims of climate impacts. Extreme weather events like cyclones and floods are frequently devastating the life and livelihood of poor, vulnerable communities living in the low-lying deltaic country. The world is struggling to keep the global temperature well below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we have taken our own steps with our very humble way. CCDB is also contributing by establishing an innovative center to strengthen climate resilience. The center is equipped to demonstrate different ecological landscape. The coastal zone representing the vast southern dynamic coastal belt. The drought zone, mimicking the northwest and central terrace landscape. The hill zone, modeling hill tracks landscape. The Hauer zone, resembling the northeastern site and Chor zone, illustrating the shifting sandbars of the deltaic riverine landscape of Bangladesh. The Learning Center has been developed for spurring innovation, capacity development and knowledge dissemination. It is a one-stop solution point to learn about climate technologies. And it can be an opportunity for people within Bangladesh, from all parts of Bangladesh, to come and see the different kinds of climate change related technologies, both adaptation as well as mitigation and for international visitors coming to Bangladesh to learn from the experience in Bangladesh. The center is providing unique services like combining research with universities and research institutions, offering internship and overseas education, technology demonstration. Bangladesh has been exceptionally vulnerable to climate change and suffering from different climate change related negative events since years. Recognizing this, Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, CCDB, has taken its climate change program to support community to deal with these events. Climate Center is one of these approaches to serve from local to global stakeholders. I hope the entire humanity will be benefited from this great endeavor. The center also aims to accommodate training, workshops and seminars. It will provide low carbon solutions, knowledge sharing and an interactive learning platform for children. Whenever I come here, I, s I see so much vision. I see people driven by inspiration and I see a work going on which is driven by the demand coming from the community, which is then reflected in a very innovative way. The upcoming attractions of the center are Climate Campus, Amphitheater, Zonal Hub and Broad Walk will provide an unprecedented experience to an audience. It will be a center of excellence for the South Asian region, which will contribute to the global goal of adaptation and mitigation under the Paris Agreement. You are cordially invited to visit CCDB Climate Center. As I, you have seen the very small video of um, climate center. This is center is um, de, has been designed in such a way so that people from different uh, ages and different different um, profession they come here and they learn from here. And this um, center is comprises of three part climate. Uh, 
three portion climate park, climate campus, and organic food production and agro tourism. And the, um, uh, the target audiences are vulnerable community students, teachers, researchers, development practitioners, and policy makers. A lot of services we are going to provide uh, from the climate center that is in the research with uh, different universities and research students, internship for the overseas students, technology demonstration, ecological development, workshop training, and green building development and low cost infrastructure development. All these services uh, and knowledge we will provide from this climate center. This is the climate center. Already I showed you in this video different um, component, coastal zone, drought zone, hilly zone, chore zone, and hour zone is uh, already demonstrated in the video. And this is the, the pictures of different zone you have already seen in the video. And this is the um, ecological landes landscape principle we followed to develop this uh, infrastructure over there, that is um, uh, biosoil, and the rain garden, continuous contour trends, vegetated biofilter strips, wild corridor, uh, native deciduous uh, forest patch, all these um, uh, 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 important uh, principles we followed to develop this um, climate center. Here we demonstrated almost, uh, we have demonstrated 32 Adapt adaptation technologies and 42 mitigation technologies so that people can learn here from the adaptation technologies and mitigation technologies and they can implement in their own community and life also. Um, the Climate Center has a partnership with the house building research institutions to develop low cost um, uh, resilient houses in different uh, climate zones in Bangladesh and we have demonstrated few of them in our climate center and we train the people so and mesh so that they can build their low cost climate resilient houses in the community level also these are the community level intervention um, we we, people, we uh, did in uh, through our project the cycle we constructed cyclone shelter uh, roads and embankments resilient houses and we also provide um, uh, clean drinking water in the community level. And we think uh, only the infrastructure uh, development, uh, building development is not the infrastructure development, but also renewable energy and energy development would come into the infrastructure development also. Therefore, we introduce different alternative sources of energy like solar and windmill so that we can become self-sufficient um, for our energy. These are the waste management component we introduce in the climate center and um, so that uh, all the waste is generating from the climate center will produce energy also. These are the biogas and um, uh, pond sand filter and the biosoil. You, you can see all these pictures over there. This is the um, buildings, how we are um, uh, constructing following the green principles, green building principles. These buildings uh, will be LEED certified, energy efficient, low carbon emission, and we, will, uh, we are introducing here um, um, environment friendly bricks and all the materials so that the uh, construction will be environment friendly and climate friendly also. Uh, so we are, we found that a lot of um, work has been done uh, by the government uh, um, uh, to help the community people, but we have some recommendations here. All the infrastructure should follow the energy efficient and low cost materials and biodiversity preservation and nature based solution should be the key priority for the resilience infrastructure. Government should revisit the building code for environmental um, sustainability and climate resilient infrastructure and investment of the infrastructure development should be done carefully to reduce the redundancy. Uh, we will open the, the inaugurate the climate center by 2022. Uh, all of you would be invited through virtually also. Thank you and now I am going back to the uh, moderator Alex. Thank you so much, Fosuela, for this very interesting presentation. And thank you to all our three panelists for their presentation. 
for starting with Thomas, who gave us an overview on the MDB side and specifically the AIB and what way there is still to go for the AIB to have truly climate resilient uh, infrastructure investment. So maybe a question starting here. Um, we know that the AIB announced their Paris alignment dates now. So they said they will be Paris aligned around mid 2023 for direct and indirect investment. So what is your assessment of this announcement? Do you want, what do you think is the most important thing now for the AIB to do? We saw that you had many, many great recommendations, but if you had to pin it down maybe to like one or two most important things that you think this is now to be done by the AIB if they say really are committed to the Paris alignment dates? Yeah, thank you for the question. I would say walk the talk. I mean, we have seen these announcements and these announcements are great. And in fact, I believe that AIIB is a very important player to make the transformation to climate resilient and carbon neutral infrastructure happen in Asia. Because usually infrastructure investments are being done in the global north by pension funds or other investors. Money is there. In the global south, it's different because investment risks for long-term investments are higher. Therefore, you need uh, MDBs to reduce the risk. And if they do the right thing, they will greatly impact the way how countries who seek investments will set the frameworks. And what we have seen from AIIB are good pledges, which we appreciate. But what is still a question mark is how they are going to operationalize, how they put into practice principles, how to bring it down to the very practical level. And we have seen quite a lot of engagement on environmental and social safeguards but we haven't seen so much engagement um, in the development of um, risk frameworks, of their key management tools. And I believe, we believe, that it is really important to mainstream and operationalize alignment principles throughout all the policies. And that should be done in a cooperative and transparent way. It should be done at best in cooperation with other investment banks. But we encourage AIIB to walk their talk in this sense and also to make it happen that other stakeholders, their investees, but civil society and the people for whom investments should serve are part of that process of operationalization. That would be my, my main demand on them. Thank you, Thomas. Um, maybe going on to Abhinash and his presentation, and I think it links quite well to the topic that uh, Thomas just mentioned on financing. And you both mentioned very big numbers on the investment needs that are, will be needed in the next decade, but also like from 2030 onwards. So, and you said that there will be enhanced investment needs and this has to go beyond the MDBs as well. So maybe from your side, can you tell us what is your call? Where do you see from which sources does financing have to come? And what is your call maybe here also at COP and to the international community? Right, thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for putting it uh, concisely, I would say. Uh, Thomas highlighted that it should be walk the talk, but I would, uh, differ a bit, and I would suggest that it should be walk the run, right? And the talk should happen in the run. It's because we have already uh, lagging behind with lot many of the investments at risk that have happened. So, and, and primarily uh, why countries like India and more vulnerable uh, to India, Bangladesh, who are more vulnerable to extreme events. What is happening is uh, the source of funding has been only through public investments. Mm -hmm. And uh, our budgetary actions actually provide that investment. But the, whereas the larger infrastructure needs have been catered by public investments, you need to 
create those risk investment pullings. And those risk investment pullings need to come in from tailor-made, customized risk financing instruments. And of late, uh, barring agriculture uh, or some of the nature-based sectors, we don't have tailor-made risk financing instruments. So that's where it, the call for action, Alex, that you asked me would be having that first step for cohesive action. Somebody like us who analyze the granular risk, identify the risk landscape, which is evolving, uh, come up and work with Thomas in order to bring that uh, cohesive action, how we can uh, implement all the resilient infrastructure principles into action, and then with German Watch, and uh, finally develop that cohesive action in a regional level, and then come up to Foyers and tell him that countries like Bangladesh should pilot those risk financing instruments, not just by investments, but by creating that infrastructure, which is sustainable, which is uh, nature best, and at the same time, it can actually cater and mitigate a lot of your risk. The other part of this story is, while we are looking at all of this, infrastructure classification differs. We don't have a unified classification of infrastructure, and that's what has been a problem. When we say infrastructure from disaster management or from a climate risk perspective, it, it goes uh, until the critical infrastructures. Now, we need to go beyond that definition. We need to create that unified uh, kind of definitions for infrastructures. Once you create that, a critical infrastructure in India or a critical infrastructure in Germany or maybe in UK needs to be understood not from the purview of disaster resilience, but from the purview of disaster resilient infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis disaster resilient investment. And that's where is the crux that uh, we need. And that is why from COP26, the uh, larger demand from the developing nations has been uh, that much of our infrastructures are yet to be built. We are just trying to get up into the development phase. And uh, while, while those plays are important, while uh, net zeros are important, the other part is please provide that committed climate finance. And the committed climate finance of $100 billion should be the floor, not the ceiling. And uh, just to give you one more number, you said those were big numbers I'm giving you. I'm just giving you one more number too before I end this. India needs more than $170 billion to climate proof its lives, livelihood, investments, and infrastructures. Where is that money going to come in, right? We need that enhanced support. We don't need that enhanced obligation. We need that support in form of an investment which can create in return job growth and sustainability and collectively that development can fetch actions. Thank you. Thank you, Avinash, for this strong call. Um, maybe to you, Fosuela. Uh, uh, you presented the Climate Center, which was very impressive that you're opening in Bangladesh. And I was wondering if there has been some international cooperation in this regard or in, to what extent do you ex have exchanged with other similarly vulnerable countries and learn from each other and exchange, maybe, maybe also India directly? Thank you, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> we are here um, uh, to connect um, Climate Center with the globe basically at this moment because we are inaugurating the center. And you, you got uh, show, I, I tried to show that how we are um, trying to become a center of excellence with all the adaptation and mitigation and resilience building approach showcasing in one center. And we are connecting this center with the decentralized center also in different regions of Bangladesh, coastal drought, where people can see live uh, after visiting the climate center, uh, how these technologies are helping people lively in the center also. And we have a wide range of partnership. We are trying to do it. Uh, that is uh, within the country, regionally and internationally. And during this partnership, uh, we found that a lot of technologies are available in the world, but that people doesn't know, people do not know. And we don't have the capacity how to use those technology. And Obviously, how we can get this 
uh, the, this technology. This is very costly technology also. So therefore, we are working uh, in such a way that we can collect this technology and we can train people, we can enhance the knowledge on those technology in the region, basically South Asia region, so that people can come and take the technology and how we can make available this technology for the poor people. That is very, very expensive. That's why we are here. So the technology should be, uh, we, uh, people, poor people will not um, disburse money for the technology. That should be free for the poor people so that they can get. And the infrastructure uh, should be like that so that any people, vulnerable people, can have access to that infrastructure. And th that would be affordable for the poor people also. If that is to make that technology affordable for the poor people, the community, international community will work. That's already Avinash all tried to say from where that money will come. The technology, showcasing the technology and capacity development of the technology people will not fulfill the, uh, their demands. There, there should be money. We need money. They will need money so that they can implement it through um, uh, their own capacity. And therefore, we are here, and we have a lot of wide range of partnership with research institutions and other uh, institutions so that we can get uh, the technologies and serve the poor people. Thank you, Alex. Alex, could I come in here? Free, free. Um, yes. I would like to link what has been said by Fusula now with um, the level of the multilateral development banks. When we look at their infrastructure portfolios, it's always huge projects. And no question, these huge projects are needed. But there is much more need than only building large roads and railways and airports. What we can clearly see is that it is poor and vulnerable people and poor and vulnerable people living in the countryside. And South Asia is still predominantly um, rural. And if you would ask people from Bangladesh or India, uh, what is your home? They would always point to their village. And during the festival season, they would go there. And more and more, due to climate stress, they cannot do that because life becomes more and more difficult in rural areas. So what I want to say is that we need much more MDB investments in rural areas, in the small towns, and not only the boom towns and mega cities of the world, and that therefore, MDBs, SAIIB, have to open new funding channels to also invest into these small and medium-sized projects. GCF is doing that, not enough, but has started to do so. I would expect MDBs to do that at much, at, at much larger scale than they do that now. If they don't change that, it will be very difficult to uh, build the infrastructure we need. Thank you so much, Thomas. I think we have a question from our, um, from our participants, and this is Mikios. Mikios, the floor is yours. Um, hello, uh, my name is Miklos Vespremi, and I was wondering, um, so a question about the CCDD Climate Center. Um, have you seen any effects so far? I mean, have people come uh, and have actually learned some of these technologies uh, and being able to implement them in their home communities. Thank you. What's his name? Miklos. Miklos. Thank you, Miklos, sir, for your uh, question. Uh, we are still um, um, developing the climate center, as I uh, tried to say, and we have started uh, some um, experimental uh, tour, tour guide um, uh, and the training for the visitors, and we found a lot of institutions like research institutions, universities, NGOs, uh, they are um, willing to visit us and they want to uh, make collaboration with CCDB Climate Center and 
uh, different organization from um, outside of the Bangladesh, they are also um, inviting CCDB Climate Center to make collaboration and send their students to uh, visit Climate Center where they will find all the information regarding Climate Center and they will be able to learn and they will be able to meet vulnerable people also. So this is how uh, the Climate Center is becoming uh, more and more interesting to the national and international institution. And we, we, uh, we hope this center will serve um, from local to global communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there, okay. So I think that was the only question from the audience we had so far, as we see. Okay. Is there anything else that you would want to add to, to the discussion that you were not able to say so far? If I can come in, Alex, then uh, we have been talking of big natural disasters, or I won't say it, uh, natural disasters anymore. They are human-induced disasters. Uh, we, whenever does human-induced disasters come in? It's more like cyclone, floods, or droughts coming in together. But there are a wide range of slow onset events, heat waves, cold waves. And that's where infrastructure also plays a very important role. And that important role is if I'm a vulnerable person, right, and I don't have access to cooling appliances, then my house, who in itself uh, which is in itself uh, primarily can't, uh, in a way, sustain that heat, right? Uh, the outside temperature would be, in tropical countries, the outside temperature normally in peak of summers will 545 to 50 degrees centigrade. Whereas the houses, if they're not built of uh, proper construction materials and are not pakka houses that we call it as, uh, then you have that uh, real field temperature going beyond 50, and those are thermal discomfort levels. Now, what it does, it, what it does is it lowers your productivity. So estimates by international labor organizations suggest that India is going to lose 30 million jobs because of heat waves. Uh, primarily, we don't have an access, right? That's a strong point. And investments from multi-developmental uh, banks needs to come into those bigger housing projects where we need to have a cross-check of whether that particular housing project or a uh, critical infrastructure project is been climate risk assessed in terms of the slow onset events as well. In UK, now uh, imagine the amount of power that's been generated. We all are talking of, and that's where the concept of adaptation mitigation co-benefit comes in, right? Uh, you need heaters in your home or, or across Europe, you need them because your temperatures are quite low. And for heating, um, for having that heating equipment installed in your house, you need the power. That power, A, should be clean, but at the same time, if you don't have that accessibility and your power breaks down, then that's also an infrastructure failure, right? Uh, in terms of disasters, this all infrastructure failures makes life more complex, right? Uh, you have a cyclone coming in, so A, it impacts your livelihood for a fisherman not going into the sea because there is a cyclone warning for 10 days. Now the cyclone has hit, your house has been ravaged, your livelihood has been ravaged, and the second part is the connectivity to the road, if alternatively they want, those are also been washed away. So it's a complex nexus, and this nexus needs to be addressed not by looking at silos. And, and when we talk of technology, technology needs to be equitable. And that is why this COP also becomes much more important on the side events while we talk and the negotiations going on in the other rooms. Uh, we need to ensure that transfer of technology should be equitable and at the same time, it should be made available and very importantly for us, it should be affordable. Affordable. Right. Thank you so if much. I may, yes. may add here. My impression is we are not yet at the point to really understand the huge challenge we are facing. I mean, we talk about infrastructure. Infrastructure is long lasting. You build your house, yeah. it will stand 80 years. 
what do we know and in how far do we factor in the climate, the climate we will face in 30, 40, 50, 80 years? I doubt that infrastructure investments, long-lasting ones, are being met from the perspective to really factor in what type of infrastructure do we need in 50, 60, 80 years? And that concerns all of us. It's not only a question for the developing world or emerging economies. And don't forget, India will become the second biggest economy uh, of the world in not too many years. It also affects, as you rightly said, our own infrastructure. And what we have seen in Germany this year with um, the, disastrous, the disastrous flash floods at the Ahr Valley clearly indicate we are not prepared. And now we build cities, and you build mega cities in India. India will become urban within the next 10, 20 years. Do, re do you really build the infrastructure of cities the way that it will withstand um, the climate we will see in 20, 30 years in terms of heat, in terms of water availability, in terms of floods? I think these are very huge challenges. And if you ask me, we always look at MDBs, we talk about the principles, we talk about operationalization and think about guidelines. In fact, much more is needed. Yeah. We need a completely different vision and a completely different working together of those working on the ground um, with poor and vulnerable people, of those being able to make the climate projections we need, of those who do the investment. So infrastructure will save us and in terms of climate um, protection and mitigation, it will crash the 1.5 if it is being done in the business as usual way. And therefore, we need all hands on deck. And I think that having bringing all hands on deck, that feeling I don't get here currently at that COP, and I think there's still a long way to go. And it's not a way to go, it's a way to run, because time is running up. Thank you so much. I think, yeah. That complements very much what uh, Abinash said earlier, so that is nice to hear. And I hope um, we can still get go somewhere at this COP and to make some progress. Um, what I was also wondering, and is also another question to Abinash, you mentioned more specifically nature-based infrastructure and the role of that. And maybe because when we think about infrastructure, we of course think first immediately roads, buildings, etc. But as you said, like we are overlooking maybe a huge part of the infrastructure. Maybe you can elaborate on that and the importance and role of that. Right. Uh, thank you, Alex. And I'm glad that uh, you asked me this question because any developmental process should have uh, the nature-based solutions and natural infrastructures at its core, right? Uh, we do have a side uh, place as well that uh, we need to plant so many trees and forests and to combat desertification. That's one of the pledges that countries have already taken. But how do we do it? Now, with the developmental paradigm or the trade-off, we have lost much of our natural ecosystems. And these natural ecosystems, uh, I mean, the, the eradication or the evacuation or the extraction, rather, I would say, of these natural uh, ecosystems have made us more vulnerable. Uh, Along the sidelines of West Bengal and Sundarbans, I mean the Sundarbans and Bangladesh, West Bengal and Bangladesh share that uh, shared Sundarbans. Uh, they have become more prone in the recent decades to tropical cyclones. Every year, tropical cyclones are hitting, and whenever that tropical cyclone hits, it doesn't demarcate what is India's border, what is Bangladesh's border. So, mangroves, forest cover, uh, having those traditional man water management practices on place. Uh, is more important, and we need to invest in terms of, uh, in a way, uh, conserving them, reintegrating them, and re-kind of building them. We just saw in the video where group of 20 women post-1999 super cyclone, it's one of the worst hit super cyclones, could come together to reinvent and reintegrate and uh, replant that forest, then probably anywhere in the world it can be done because they don't have, A, the technology, 
B, they don't have money from the MDBs, but what they have is strong willpower and the traditional practices. So we need to invest in that. That is why building that local capacity is at the core in terms of saving, because India as a country has been able to save lives from disasters, but not averting loss and damages of infrastructures. So building that local capacity, what Poise also said and, and Thomas also touched upon, is very important. And I think a substantial portion of the money should get into this in terms of having that information done. Thank you so much. And maybe another question to uh, Fosueli on the, on the Climate Change Center. So you said that you will be opening in 2022. Do you have plans beyond that? So what, what happens after the center is opened to scale up this kind of um, yeah, centers in different parts or? Thank you, Alex. Um, we have started this uh, endeavor, novel endeavor, from since 2016 onwards, uh, along with the partnership uh, with different organizations. And, um, and now we are at the state, we are going to inaugurate one part of uh, the center, that is climate part, and uh, we will complete it, the full part, within the next two or three years. That is our plan. Uh, this is a huge test, and uh, we uh, have we are looking for partnership at this moment with around the world globe, and we have a meeting with the Greenwich University uh, on 15th. They want to make a partnership with Climate Center, so that they want to make their research um, on Bangladesh and how they can use our Climate Center for the students also, and this is how we are trying to connect Climate Center with different regions of the world mm -hmm. and different institutions. But uh, I think uh, these kinds of, uh, these types of center is required for um, different region also, so that regional people can see um, uh, the climate change impact, they can figure out the impact, they can figure out the problem, they can see the and uh, technologies, they can raise their knowledge, they can raise their capacity. And the learning is very much interactive. And we are trying to make the learning interactive. People will be able to touch their learning over there. So that they will visit, they will not forget. That is our vision. They will visit, they will not forget. So from the students, children, and the researchers, any educated person, policymakers, they will visit, and they will have some sorts of learning from here. From so that they can apply it in their profession, in their personal life, and they will be able to contribute to the climate change. That is uh, the vision of this center. And uh, uh, I think um, we'll have a very good partnership with Africa, okay. with some of the American organization under the umbrella of Bread for the World, who are funding for this climate center. So we will have a very good. Um, uh, networking, a lot of organization in the India, they are also connected, already connected, and they will, they are started visiting the center also to get the learning, uh, where all the technologies, all the climate learning, they will find in one, one center. I hope uh, this center will have a um, greater impact uh, in different regions of the world. Thank you so much. And I think um, we are a bit running out of time. So I would really like to thank you three. It was a great discussion. And thank you so much for the excellent case studies. I think we learned a lot about MDBs and their role they play in having a resilient and inclusive infrastructure, especially the AIB. And I hope they listened to you. And we learned a lot uh, from the why it has to be people-centered. And we also learned a great example of what is currently going on in Bangladesh. And we hope that many other countries will follow the example and can learn from your experience. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.